Let's consider for a moment. Welcome back, by the way, to the second hour of our show. Tom Hartman here with you. Let's consider for a moment what the American dream is. What is the American dream? Uh, there, there's an op-ed or an editorial by Frederick Morton in today's Oregonian, our, our statewide paper uh, owned by a New York corporation. And in it, Frederick Morton is talking about what must be done to restore the American dream. And he talks about the map of your truly American life charts a freeway leading from a log cabin, literal or figurative, to the White House or the billionaire's topiary garden. In other words, the concept that has been that is being put forward by many people is that the American dream is that you too can become rich, famous, or powerful. I would submit to you that while that is part of the American mythology and it's part of the American reality, it's one of the extraordinary things about this country. We've got we've got a guy right now who, if he had been busted when he was doing a little blow back in the day, may well be just another African American man in prison who who's who lived on food stamps for a while and yet who had because of the extraordinary promise of this country and because he get, didn't get trapped up in our dysfunctional drug laws which we'll talk about some other time and the same by the way was true for Bill Clinton who didn't inhale and I and I'm guess and and you know and George W Bush as well there's there's plenty of evidence that he was actually a fairly heavy cocaine user in fact, that he got busted for it in his young days and had to spend 90 days uh, in a uh, uh, doing community service. But nonetheless, our American our American dream has been recalibrated since the Reagan years, as you two can get rich, and that was the American dream that was peddled during the 19th century as well, when the middle class was pretty much gone. We've had two periods in America of a strong middle class. One was in the 1700s, the late 1700s, and it led to the American Revolution. The other was in the middle part of the 20th century, from the 1940s to the 1980s. And that led to the 60s, right, and the 70s, a time of social ferment. And in both cases, we had conservatives saying, oh, this, this, this middle class is a terrible thing. We need to go back to the American dream being... Most of us are worker bees, most of us are the working poor, and occasionally one of us rises up and becomes president or becomes the CEO of a big corporation, becomes a millionaire or a billionaire. That's the American dream. I would submit to you that the American dream that most Americans really want is the American dream of the middle class. It's the European dream. It's the dream of being able to, if you work hard, and do something that, and, and have an opportunity to do something you care about. You can go to college for free. You can go to trade school for free. You can learn how to be a productive member of society at no expense. Your health insurance is covered. Your health care is covered. You don't have to worry about falling into poverty and homelessness. And you can get a good, decent job. And with a good, decent job, if you work your 40 hours a week and you play by the rules and you're an honest player and you do a good job, at the end of your life, you can retire with a decent pension and health care, and throughout your life, you have enough of an income that you can buy a home, you can buy a car, and you can put your kids through school and take an occasional vacation. That's the middle class, the real middle class. That's the American dream. And that's, frankly, the, the vast majority. And this phony American dream of you two can get rich, this is the stuff that's sold by lotteries. This is the stuff that's sold by conservatives. This is the stuff. This it's it's like salvationist thinking. It's like it's 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 the exact same thing, or it, metaphorically, it's the exact same thing that was being said to slaves back a hundred years ago and two hundred years ago and three and four hundred years ago of just say your prayers and sing your spirituals and when you die you'll go to heaven and be with Jesus. And sorry, right now you're a slave. But someday, you'll, have, you'll achieve your dream. In fact, that's still being told to us. It's being told to the Muslim suicide bombers. Oh, yeah, you know, life is hell, and, and you're going to blow yourself up. But you're going to hit the jackpot. And I would say that salvationist thinking and jackpot-based American dream thinking is something that's very dysfunctional. And instead, we need to get back to an American dream, which is, which is the, a strong and healthy middle class. And the ways that we do that are pretty straightforward. We have a reasonable trade policy. 
that says that we're going to make things in the United States. We're going to have a trade policy that actually encourages companies and tax policies that actually encourage companies to stay in the United States and punishes them when they leave. We're going, you know, of course we want to be able to import things. I mean, you know, only the French make French wines. Only the Thais carve sandalwood in a really cool way. You know, only the, I mean, fill in the blank. All around the world there are people who have unique things that they make that we don't make here. But that's, that's really peripheral. That's a, that's a tiny part of our trade. You know, when the Great Depression started, international trade was 4.6% of the American economy, of our GDP. It was about a little over 4%. And as a consequence of the Great Depression, it wasn't Smoot-Hawley. It was the Great Depression. Because Smoot-Hawley was already passed, and it didn't, it didn't drop inter trade as a part of America's GDP that much. As a, as a consequence of the, of the Great Depression, it dropped down into the 2% 2, 2 range. Now we have this enormous amount of international trade, but it's not really international trade. This large percentage of our, of our current GDP that is international trade is actually companies simply shifting American manufacturing overseas. That should be wrong. The, the, and the consequence of that is that we have this huge supply, an oversupply of labor, so people no longer, A, have, have the ability, they, they don't have the means of the ability since, you know, 30 years of, of war on college students. Used to be, you could go to college, you know, my, Louise worked her way through college as a waitress at a Howard Johnson's. You know, I worked my way through college to the extent that I did, I didn't graduate, but I worked my way through college or at least once, twice, <laughs> worked my way through college as a DJ making three bucks at two dollars and sixty cents an hour and pumping gas and working as a waiter in Bob's Big Boy and, and a cook and a, and a dishwasher and I mean you know it's I, I did all kinds of things I for a summer I picked apples up in northern Michigan with migrant farm workers you could work yourself through college doing it that you know doing that back back in the day and, and you should be able to now so there's that. And then there's also this thing about David Ricardo. In 1917, David Ricardo came up with what is often referred to as his iron law of wages, his iron law of labor. And what Ricardo said is that when the supply of labor, when the number of people in the workforce is equal to or exceeds the demand for labor, in other words, when there's more people looking for jobs than there are employers looking for workers, then the price of labor will fall to what Ricardo called, in 1817, a subsistence level. In other words, the working poor. That's the norm. That's what we've had for 7,000 years. The vast majority of workers are the working poor. So how do you prevent there being the working poor? What you have to do is you have to have the supply of labor be slightly smaller than the demand for labor so that employers are competing with each other for workers. Now, Alan Greenspan saw his job as chairman of the Fed to do the exact opposite, to make, it, to make sure that, the, that, that employers were not competing with each other for workers. He, and he told the Wall Street Journal in 1997, and I, I quote this, I document this in my book, Screwed, that he felt that his job was to maintain a certain minimum level of worker insecurity so that we didn't have what Greenspan referred to as wage inflation. In other words, those pesky workers asking for more money. So this is, this is, this is what we're seeing. And by the way, I, I want to take this into immigration because this is what we're seeing now all over the world. I'm, I'm looking here at today's Financial Times, page 3. A huge headline to, right at the top. Jobless migrants should leave, say many in EU, the European Union. Most people in the European Union's five largest member states want the immigrants to leave their countries. Why? Because they're having the same problem we're having. They have, they have bought into Reaganism and Thatcherism and free trade, and even within the EU, they've, they've created this bizarre kind of free trade in the EU, and the, concept, the European Union, and the consequence of this has been that cheap labor comes in, the labor supply People are going from poor countries into wealthy countries, increasing the labor supply and crashing the cost of labor. And, and, the, and the middle class is getting wiped out. 
rather than staying in their own countries where the countries should have their own policies that create a middle class in those countries. And we have the same thing in here in the United States. And which is why I said, you know, I, I keep saying we have an illegal employer problem. But I find this really interesting. 79% of Italians, 78% of Brits, 71% of Spaniards, 67% of Germans, 51% of French. They want to ask jobless immigrants to leave. And who are these immigrants? This is fascinating. I'll tell you right after the break. This is the Tom Hartman Program. 